Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Energy News Beat Podcast. My name is Stu Turley, President and CEO of the Sandstone Group. I'll tell you what, we are in a complicated energy world right now. We, In order to get to net zero, we're going to have to have all forms of energy on deck and operating smoothly. And I've got a fantastic guest to come up and visit with us about nuclear energy and the waste problems coming around. I've got Elizabeth Miller and Liz as really the founder and CEO, board director and nuclear power and climate change entrepreneur. Welcome. Thank you for stopping by the podcast. Thank you so much, Stu. I'm really excited for our conversation. Well, you've got some great news. You are now a board member and you've now handed the reins of your other company off. Tell us about this. This is exciting news. I have. And it's a tremendous moment of pride and humility as well, as you recognize that, first of all, your company may not need you as much as it once did. (laughs) And, you know, creating something that can live without you. I mean, I guess you must feel the same when your kids sort of go off and become successful adults. It's wonderful. And it also feels a little bit humbling and a little bit of a loss, too, at the same time. So lots of big emotions. Well, as you're you're going through a a change here, you know, it's kind of like an empty nester. You're now been pushed out of the nest, I I think, in a great way. So yeah, it's it's very exciting. But one of the things that I was noticing as we're getting ready for this uh, podcast was your article on LinkedIn that you had shared out a few days ago. And I I thought that was pretty impressive. You know, we've got Diablo Canyon in California providing a ballpark of 10% of the power for California. And there is, we need more nuclear. But you made a, as we were getting ready and visiting about this, there's a real problem with why people are anti-nuclear. Can you go into a little bit about your thoughts on that? Yeah, so the public perception of nuclear power is shifting and it has been shifting over a number of years now. So we are getting to the point where more and more Americans are supportive of nuclear power. And this is largely because of climate change. And so whereas 15 years ago, people were concerned about different things, today, climate change means that we need clean, secure, low cost energy. And nuclear is now sort of back in the mix in people's minds as something that they recognize that we need. Now, for those people who don't support nuclear power, and even for those who, many of those who do support nuclear power, there's still this overhanging, what about the waste? And and, nuclear waste is compact, it's small, it's very safe where it's stored today. So so I don't want to minimize that. And that is true. But at the same time, there is no disposal solution for for nuclear waste, for spent nuclear fuel or high-level nuclear waste today um, anywhere in the world. Nobody has ever disposed of the stuff. And that is a personal frustration of mine because we all know where it needs to go. And there's even a consensus on, on how to do that. We just right. haven't been able to successfully take action on actually disposing of it. Wouldn't it seem to be a wonderful thing to be able to use it in thorium reactors or actually use the waste from one reactor and use it in another reactor? That to me seems like a great thing that we could do around the world. We could power and get rid of energy poverty if we had actually use it in thorium reactors and using the molecules out of the waste in other reactors. Yeah, there's there's a lot of different feelings on that. So there's there's a bunch of people who are very supportive about recycling and reusing spent nuclear fuel. And there's right. a lot going for that argument. It it is a source of power potentially and it is, you know, helping to minimize the the waste right. that exists today. On the other hand, there's other people who think that it might make more sense economically to bring in new fuel, not you don't really want to touch this stuff. You don't really want to get near right. it. And so there's the and there's potentially some risk of proliferation if if you were to do this. So it's a it's a controversial subject. Right. I think it doesn't, you know, personally I'm neutral on it. I think we can right. go either way. But whichever way you go, you're still going to need a waste disposal solution. So right. the waste, you know, if you do want to recycle or reprocess, you're going to want to use 
new fuel or, or, or rather recent spent nuclear fuel. You're not going to want the old stuff that's been right. sitting there for, for 30 or 40 years. And so that stuff is still going to need a disposal solution. And as you reprocess yep. and recycle, you're also going to generate waste. And so that's still going to need a solution. So it, it, it changes the form factor a bit, but it doesn't right. really solve the issue of you still need a waste disposal solution. Oh, outstanding points. Liz, those are those are fabulous. I was about a year and a half ago, I interviewed Thomas Jam. He's the CEO of Copenhagen Atomics. And I loved what they were doing with their thorium reactors and their their waste byproducts and things. And when you take a look at how that all comes about. It's about getting the lowest kilowatt per hour to everyone on the planet with the least amount of impact on the environment. Yeah. That seems like a very easy thing to say, but pretty complicated in trying to deliver it when we're facing this. And, and it is fun to see the nuclear resurgence in saying, you know, if we're, if, if people, Liz, are clamoring for net zero, I don't think we're going to get to net zero now that AI has surfaced. AI pretty much effectively killed a net zero, in my opinion. And that's because now people are, the data centers are just clamoring for more and more energy. And in order to get to the net zero goals, to get to the EVs that are being you know, mandated and those things, we have to double the grid that we're going to do in the next 10 years. It took us 100 years to get here. I don't know if we can make it. Yeah, I guess I'll have a little bit more optimism than you would. I, I would say, I don't know if we could do it without nuclear, exactly. but I think with nuclear power, I think we do have the potential to, to do this. And, we, and I'll maybe add, go ahead. But, but we don't have, we have zero big nuclear reactors on the blocks right now. Zero. We have three grid reactors that are in the approval process, and one of them being at Texas Christian as a an entry level one. We've got to get out of the great way and turn our nuclear folks loose if we're going to make it as far as that goes, because the government is in the way, it seems. So I, I agree that we're going to need to move really, really quickly. I think that's completely true. I also excited by the passage of the Advance Act just yes. last month, which is now directing the regulator to think about the benefits of nuclear power in addition to the safety right. of nuclear power. So we're yet to see exactly what the impact is, is going to be. And the regulator has been, you know, I think thinking about this and moving in the direction right. of efficiency for a long time. The advanced reactor companies, there's a lot of them. I mean, I think there's there's yep. a lot of companies that are ready to go as soon as we enable yep. and empower them to do so. Right. Um, so there are still issues that need to be fixed, but I, I think I'm I'm pretty optimistic about where things are going to go in the next five to 10 years. I am more op optimistic than I had been even six months ago, even eight months ago. So I, I, I think this is phenomenal. I think that the bridge, though, is, is fixing the regulatory issues. And we're going to see a lot of natural gas power plants come online that don't need to if we went straight to nuclear. And I, I, I really think we should try to muscle our way into that nuclear space personal opinion. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I completely agree. And the other thing that I think, so, so sort of bring this back to the nuclear waste issue. You know, so California, for example, which you mentioned earlier, is not allowing any new nuclear power in the state until the waste right. problem is solved. So there, there are a dozen or so states in, in the U.S. that are saying no new nuclear power until we've solved the nuclear waste problem. So this right. is also a opportunity for us to take advantage of new innovations in solving for nuclear wow. waste disposal to solve that problem and to help enable the growth of new nuclear power. Wow. I'm sitting here thinking, but defining the waste is going to be interesting because when you say no new nuclear until the waste problem is solved is going to be a pretty big one. Because as Liz, as we bring this up, new uranium as you come in, and this waste topic is critical. I would rather though buy, use my old waste rather than buy uranium from Ukraine. Right now, we currently buy 20% of our new uranium 
or is it 22, 22% of our uranium is Russian? I think yeah. something like that. Why are we supporting Russia with that? Yeah. And I think there's many people who feel the same way as you do. But what the regulations state is so it's it's not so much that they say that the waste has to be recycled or can't be recycled. I think there's some flexibility right. in that or there will be some flexibility in that. Mm -hmm. But as I mentioned earlier, if you recycle or reprocess, you still have waste that needs to go into disposal. So right. recycling, reprocessing does not get away from the need for a disposal solution. And that's that's what we, I think, need to solve in order for California and other states to be able to have a future for nuclear power. I sure hope people look to you as a resource and the experts, because when we're writing those regulatory issues, if we take something like the Copenhagen Atomics or the other companies that are using other nuclear spent waste and turning it to a non-radioactive byproduct, that waste platform is going to be easier to get through. And so, you know, when you take a look at, yes, you're going to have that waste there. I hope that just because it doesn't, it comes out of a nuclear reactor, it's not going to get put into the other one over here and then get tied up over there. So hopefully some sanity can come out of this, if that makes sense. Yeah, it, it does. And and to be clear, Europe, I think, is thinking ahead of the U.S. on this. Yes. So the, the EU has moved forward. Their new taxonomy says that new nuclear power will be considered green if it comes with a waste disposal solution. So yay, that's great. That's that's as it should be. And so if we're seeing, it comes nice. It comes with a waste. And, and so we're seeing governments in Europe and companies in Europe that are looking to build new nuclear power now have an incentive to to figure out the waste disposal solution in a way that they hadn't been required to before. In the U.S., however, we're still in a bit of a bind. So in the U.S., unfortunately, there is a law that says that all nuclear waste must go to Yucca Mountain. And oh. Yucca Mountain is, there's currently no plans to ever open it. It's not being built. It's not being developed. And yet no other waste disposal solutions can be considered until Yucca Mountain is operational. Wow. So we are in a bit of a bind here in the U.S., unlike Europe, that is able to, to move forward more comprehensively. That to me is horrific. I can understand. Yeah. I mean, so deep isolation, what is deep isolation do for this waste product? Problem. So deep isolation is providing a method for disposing of nuclear waste that is where everyone agrees it needs to be. So deep underground where it can't be touched by hurricanes or, or right. armies or, or anyone. And we're doing this by bringing together new technology out of the oil and gas sector, so specifically right. around directional drilling. So nuclear waste, as many of your listeners probably know, is remarkably compact. You know, people talk about how little nuclear waste there is because you compare it to coal or anything else, and right. it's, it really is remarkably little waste. If you take advantage of the fact that it is so dense and you can put it down an 18-inch borehole a mile underground and seal it up, and this is very safe, and you don't need people underground. So th this is the difference of what deep isolation is proposing wow. as opposed to a big underground mined repository that has air and people and means you can't go as deep because you need to maintain those air and safety for, for, for the people and the workers underground. That is incredibly interesting. Now, would you put the, the material in a casket or a sarcophagus, some kind of sealed? Because I could just see the questions rolling around on this and saying, oh, by the way, oh, it's going to get into the water tables. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, there's an interesting answer, which is that when you are above the water table, there is potentially a risk that if something gets out of the container, it is, it could yeah. eventually go down and get into the water table. When you are under the water table, it sort of depends on the depth. I mean, there, things will potentially migrate up through the rock, right. um, but very slowly. We're talking about my, my, migration through solid rock. 
So when you have a billion tons of rock that it needs to migrate through, you can calculate the speed of potential migration through that rock. And we're looking at time periods of one to one and a half million years for anything to migrate up to the potentially the, the, the water table, wow. at which point it's no longer going to be dangerous. So these are calculations that we've done, we've modeled out. Oh. And generally speaking, you can be safe enough for short periods of time when you're above the water table. If you're just slightly below the water table, you're going to need a lot of engineering work in order to make sure that nothing can get out and potentially get up to the water table. Right. But when you're a mile underground or a kilometer underground, you can calculate that really the 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 container itself, so the canister that we're, we're using, right. is not an essential piece of the protection. It's really the rock that you're using to guarantee that nothing ever gets wow. up and into the water table. This is really cool because now what kind of developments have been done to seal the hole? Because normal cement does not last nearly as long. Is there a new kind of sealant technology that you're looking at? Yeah. So th there are lots of different types of seals that can be used. Again, when you're looking at a relatively shallow repository, the seal right. is, is quite important. And then there's been work that's been done on, on sealing for shallow mined repositories. Right. When you're looking at, again, sort of a kilometer to three kilometers underground, you have, and you don't put anything in the vertical shaft. So all of their waste is either at the bottom in the, the sort of lower, the deepest part, if you're in a vertical borehole, or if right. you're in a horizontal borehole, you just lay it out horizontally in, in the directional drilled part. Um, and then you seal the vertical shaft. So you're talking about a kilometer of sealant. Right. And it makes the the material that you use for the sealant less important because there's so much of it. And so even if it does migrate okay. through it a little bit, it'll migrate up and get dispersed, migrate up, get dispersed. And you find that nothing gets to the, the top of the surface or the water table. Wow. Uh, I'll tell you, this is actually very cool. How do we get you in front of Congress to get extra money? Since they're handing, <laughs> since they're printing money like nobody else's uh, business these days. Yeah, no, it's a it's a great question, and I think that Congress is recognizing the importance of nuclear waste disposal. the The barrier is that we are going to have to amend the Nuclear Waste Policy Act. So this is not a light wow. lift. This is a, a heavy lift. Now there. Are are places where deep isolation and others could potentially start that are in more of a gray zone. So new nuclear power, for example, is the, right. the waste is not necessarily destined for Yucca Mountain. From some of the research and defense facilities, the waste is not necessarily dedicated to, to Yucca Mountain. Right. But for all commercial reactors that operate in the U.S. today, their waste has been declared by the Nuclear Waste Policy Act that it is going to Yucca Mountain. Now, the Department of Energy was supposed to collect it by 1998, exactly. and that didn't happen. And now there's no real expectation that it's going to be starting up again. But until that Nuclear Waste Policy Act is changed, no alternatives can be can be developed, and, and that is a challenge. Wow, this is amazing! And 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 so you step, and you're now the chairman of the board there. And and so are you going to take this opportunity to go try and, and visit with the le legislature and the government to try to focus on this as opposed to your day to day activities that you used to do? Yeah, I think what we really need is we need a win. We we need a yes. example that we can point to. So before we get up into Congress and we say, you know, believe us, this is safe enough. We need to point yes. to someone somewhere in the world where we've done this before. And so we're looking at opportunities, as I mentioned earlier, in Europe, where there right. is no significant barrier. There is no Nuclear Waste Policy Act equivalent. Um, and so governments can move forward with waste disposal right. options. And we've been working with quite a few of them. And we're also looking at opportunities in the U United States where we can prove this out for other types of waste. So for advanced reactor wastes or for defense and research waste. Oh, this is actually very, very cool. I, I, I'll tell you, this is one that I would really hope gets some traction because we are not going to make it to net zero without nuclear. 
We're not yeah. going to make it without natural gas and people do yeah. not like natural gas. In fact, unfortunately, Liz, coal is still king. Around the world, coal, we're using more coal now than we did in previous years because yeah, people want power, electricity. And you're not going to get off of coal until we can fix nuclear. I you know, and you, you touched on earlier with the growth of AI and, and data centers, and there is this massive need for, for new power. And I do think that we can get there with nuclear. I think it is the best chance for, for getting there yes. and to, for doing it in a clean and secure and reliable way. But there are still some significant barriers to, to doing that, that, that we need to overcome. Wow. Well, this is exciting. How do people reach you and, and try to get more information from you? So deepisolation.com, we have a website. People are also free to email me directly. So I'm just Liz at deepisolation.com. Oh, and I'm following you on LinkedIn as well. So LinkedIn yeah, is also you, great. You're out there. So, well, thank you so much for stopping by the podcast today. And we will have all this in the show notes. And I'll tell you what, I want to have you back again as we get further down the road, because if there are any updates from Deep Isolation, I do want to get that out there uh, to our listeners and everything else. So thank you so much. Thank you, Stu. This was a lot of fun and I'd love to come back. Thanks. Thank <laughs> you.